Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my fine friends. Welcome to another uh, episode of the Tom Petty Project podcast. This is the podcast that digs into the entire Tom Petty catalogue, song by song, album by album, and includes conversations with musicians, fans, and people connected with Tom along the way. I'm your host, Kevin Brown, and I'm joined once again uh, by my co-host, John Paulson, for today's episode, which is a wrap-up of Hard Promises. Thanks for joining me again, John. Um, how are things with you? I'm uh, I'm doing well. I'm happy to be here, and uh, I believe that you are very high on this album. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it, especially um, for side A. Right on. And I believe that uh, since we last spoke, you attended a pretty big concert. How was that? Yeah, uh, Paul McCartney in in Boston, which is the second time I've actually seen him this year. Uh, my son came down sick at the first show and did not have a good uh have a very good time uh so we were in boston we saw that paul mccartney was playing there at fenway and we decided to get tickets to go and see him again uh just not so sure how long he'll be touring so uh it was a it was a great show you know he, it's funny he tells all the same stories uh from from show to show and yeah. uh, it, it got to be a joke running joke with me and my son because he would go into a story and my son would just look at me and roll his eyes but um everybody else was enjoying the story <laughs> well that's the thing right he's, he's, he's playing for so many millions of people that there's always going to be probably at least half the crowd's never seen him before or even more maybe right and fenway exactly. park that fenway park must have been a fantastic place to go watch a gig because that's such an iconic historic venue yeah, that was uh, I first my first time being there, and it's it's you know the 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 park itself is so old and just has so much history to it. But it was interesting walking in there after uh, going to see him at SoFi Stadium, which is brand new. Uh, so it was definitely a dichotomy there between the two the two stadiums, and it was it was funny to see some other uh, buildings around that have a, can look in on the show, and they were all having a party and watching the concert from uh, their rooftop uh, bars or whatever. So it was a, a pretty cool scene. Any highlights from it? Any songs that you blew away? Uh, I mean, they they have this uh, portion for I've Got a Feeling, which is one of my favorite Beatles songs. Uh, and apparently Peter Jackson was able to uh, bring in the audio and, the, uh, and some video from John Lennon's portion from the rooftop concert. So they're able to do a duet with him and Paul McCartney. And uh, it's really it's a treat because it's it's cool to hear his voice come in. Uh, as part of the show as well because that, that song especially it's the two of them kind of going back and forth with their different lyrics and um, they kind of you know piece their two songs together to make that song and uh, it's it was, it was towards the end of the show so it was a nice way to sort of wrap, wrap things up yeah that's awesome yeah queen i went and saw queen um, with adam lambert a few years ago and they did the same thing with um love of my life they brought freddie in like as the vocal there and i had the crowd and the uh, call and response kind of thing which was just it's super cool and i think it can be cheesy but if you do it right, it's also, like you said, you get that voice sort of almost comes out of the blue and you remind me, oh, yeah, of course. Love John, you know. Yeah, the way Paul set it up, it was, you know, he told a story about Peter Jackson and the whole uh, documentary that, that he did and uh, set it up for the audience. So it wasn't like it was a surprise. It was it was kind of a surprise, okay. but it was like they knew what to expect, but they were also like super excited about it, the way he described it. So yeah, it worked awesome. well. Super cool. It's nice when you've got friends like Peter Jackson who can do things like that for you, right? Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> okay, let's um, let's dig into Hard Promises. Um, I'll give you some sort of vital statistics about the album. So, again, it's the second album on the Backstreet Records imprint. Uh, I've recorded a game at Sound City in Van Nuys and Cherokee Studios in Hollywood with some additional recording at Good Night Studio in L.A. Again, it was produced by Jimmy Iovine and Tom Petty and engineered by Shelley Yakis with a runtime of 39 minutes and 33 seconds. It was released on May 5th, 1981 and reached number five in the US chart, but it was again number one in New Zealand. All those Kiwis, they, they sure love their Petty. Um, there were no leftover songs from these sessions that have turned up so far with only Gator on the Lawn, which was the B-side from A Woman in Love, and obviously the original take of Stop Dragging My Heart Around um, being the additional tracks from the album that we, we don't see in the track listing so we also have a few additional musicians on this one obviously stevie nicks um, and her sister laurie nicks uh, did backing vocals on insider and she did uh, vocals on you can still change your mind sharon Solani uh, did also backing vocals on you can still change your mind then duck dunn comes on um, bass on a woman in love phil jones added in some more percussion and we get that single piano note from bugs widell on night watchman so let's go to the track listing and we can uh, we can discuss so we said we were going to start with side one so i'll let you lead off yeah, I think these uh, first two tracks really are, you know, merit discussion. They were both released as singles. The Waiting was obviously a huge hit for him. Uh, and it was the interesting thing about this when I was researching the track, and you probably ran across the same stuff, but 
you know, he worked backward from the course. He usually works linear, apparently. Yeah. Uh, starting from the beginning of the song. And uh, in this case, he had the chorus and then having to try to get the verses and get the opening and all that, that must be a little frustrating. I, I guess he worked on it for a while, which makes sense. And the track's called The Waiting. So <laughs> it all sort of lines <laughs> up. But I mean, I love the I love the uh, the opening there. Baby, don't feel like heaven right now. Don't feel like something from a dream. Uh, it's just another indication or another case where he uh, is able to grab the listener with a really good opening line and a lot of nostalgia there. And I also like the... Uh, yeah, I might have chased a couple of women around. All I ever got me was down. That was a, yeah. That's another very memorable. Um, this is a 10 for 10 song for me. Obviously, it ended up uh, as a hit for him and ended up in the Greatest Hits uh, album uh, as well. Just definitely one that's a part of all my playlists. Uh, just a great track. And it's one of those that I always think that, again, even listen to it critically, it's a very simple song. It's a simple chord progression. There's not a lot of complexity in it. There's not a lot of real interplay between parts, but... It's so well written. And, you know, Paul Zolo asked Tom, any idea what makes a melody work? And Tom says, I think it's a simple as, can you hum it in your head? Does it do something to you when you hear it? Is it a friendly thing? Do you want to hear it again? Right? And so mm -hmm. four for four in this song, like you don't need to overcomplicate things. If you can write a melody that pure and that beautiful, it just works every single time, right? Yeah, and I think his vocal performance may be the most complex thing on the song. Like he, the way he's kind of getting the words out in a, you know, a different tempo at different spots. Uh, but he's, he had a knack for that. Like he, we saw that in tr you know previous tracks, like he, his vocals are kind of underrated, I think, in terms of how he uh, puts them out. But um, just a just a fantastic track. Great way to open the album. Well, and one that I don't know if you came across this in your research too, but Jimmy Iovine was absolutely devastated that this didn't, like he thought this was going to be bigger than Refugee. He thought this is the song that's going to be because he just loved it, which is why it obviously comes off as lead track. And you sort of agree that you would think that it's it's just made for radio, this one, right? You think it should have been an absolute smash. But, of course, um, Stop Dragging My Heart Around gets released right around the same time. And then that takes, that's what they thought, took a little bit of steam, a little bit of wind out of the sails, possibly. Yeah, I believe Mike Campbell uh, was in an interview for the uh, documentary and mentioned that uh, uh, Don't uh, Stop Dragging My Heart Around. Stevie was so excited about how well that single was doing and saw him in a, in a hotel and he's like oh that just knocked our track right out of, yeah. out of the water <laughs> uh so yeah that probably is the reason why because they weren't going to play a lot of radio stations were going to play two petty tracks at the same time at that point in his career probably exactly i think that's probably the, the case and so moving on to you said like the first two tracks especially woman in love that's the one that i had when i was going through and did did my uh, the song episode that's the one that i'd earmarked is just an absolute vocal tour de force like that's petty as a vocalist at his absolute peak to me and, and i think it's as good as almost anything he did in his career, really. Yeah, and it's the change of tempo, too, that I really like. He mentioned yeah. it uh, in a quote about uh, playing it live in a show. A lot of times it's very effective to just suddenly bring a roar to a whisper, and it always moves the audience. Uh, this is, to me, like this is the first, uh, I believe, you know, bigger, biggish single that didn't make the Greatest Hits compilation. I'm always fascinated by what makes it, when, what didn't make it. You could definitely argue it's one of a handful of tracks that you could argue should be on the greatest hits or could be on the greatest hits. Uh, I love the way that uh, this song kicks off after the end of the waiting. Like it, it almost seems to me like these two songs were meant to be played together. Uh, yeah. Really, really nicely done. And uh, just how it kicks off and uh, duck guns playing the bass. Uh, Tom is just singing over the bass part. Uh, and then, you have Mike just kind of coming in and out just as beautiful yeah. as he does, like knowing when to play, when not to play. And then it just explodes into this chorus and uh, you know, the chords, Mike's chords hit and the guitar riffs hit. And it's just, it's just, uh, it's tremendous. Um, I, I probably give this an eight and a half or a nine out of 10. Um, and I like, this is on all my petty uh, playlists, basically. It's a, it's a, yeah. it's one of those kind of lost hits of his that uh, maybe doesn't get as much airplay now but uh you know at the time it was pretty big and you know you could argue this should be on his uh, uh the first greatest hits compilation yeah i, I completely agree and I, th I think it's when you i always when i get when you get greatest hits compilations i'm always a little bit leery about new songs being on there because it's the greatest hits right like and i mean i know that we got mary jane's last dance and no one's going to argue that that should be on there but something in the air as a cover it's a great cover but 
instead of this song, and there's probably a couple of others that we'll talk about before we get to Greatest Hits, I think you would say, well, I'd much rather have that on there than something in the air. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think that's a uh, record company thing to get the diehard fans to buy the compilation yep. when they when they probably already have all the albums that all the you know they have all these tracks um on all the different albums um i still pr would probably have bought it uh even without any sort of new content on there because yeah i liked it you know especially in the record day age it's nice to have them all in a in a one you know one disc set or whatever so that you can just play them in a row and not have to fiddle with your your record player but uh we, yeah i definitely have some thoughts on the greatest hits compilation when we get to it <laughs> well the other thing that i've mentioned uh in the episode and i'm kind of curious what your thoughts are but Duck Dunn plays based on this one. You know, the, the couple of tracks are the tracks he's played before with the Heartbreakers where you think, okay, yeah, well, that's a very distinctive bass line. That's, you know, Ron Blair wouldn't play like that. He just, and the song kind of needs that groove to it. But this one, this is a pretty straight up rocker. And in terms of sort of the bass line itself, it's not massively complex. It's keeping the route going pretty much. And I'm really curious why they brought him in for this one rather than Ron Blair playing it. And I wonder if it was anything to do with Ron sort of being in that, transitional phase where he was sort of you know heading his way out of the band but again you've also got tom petty who plays a mean bass so I, i'm really kind of curious i just maybe he was just around and they said well do you want to come play on this one then i wonder what the reason for that would be yeah and it's kind of speculation because we don't you know we weren't there and i think as you get further away from the recording of the album the the time period gets compressed when they're remembering their stories about things like oh this happened during this these yeah. sessions so maybe it happened for this reason but this was, you know, watching the documentary portion again for Hard Promises, this was the time uh, when uh, Ron was starting to, I think he, they, they said that, I think it was uh, Mike or Tom that said they're pretty hard on people in the band if they're not playing the way that they want them to play or whatever. Yeah. And it was starting to, starting to catch up to Ron. And maybe this was a situation where he was like, okay, well, I don't want to play today. And so they had Duck, Duck Dunn there to, <laughs> to fill in. That's not bad. That's not a bad feeling. Oh, God. Yeah, no kidding. It's funny, I mean, I was thinking about that too, like with artists who are hard on musicians or producers even, right? But it's that thing, of, it's the same thing with Torpedoes when Iovine's just caning and Stan and making him take and take and take and take. But it's got to be the best. And that's, that's sort of a, a signature thing throughout Tom's entire career. He never put anything out that he didn't feel was, you know, top quality. And I think they even said in interviews, he said, we always tried to write, every single song, we tried to write the best song we could write every single time. I mean, I think, you know, you don't always hit that, but I think having that work ethic and that ethos is definitely, that's the way to greatness. And Ron clearly wasn't, you know, he wasn't as fully invested in being the best of the best of the best at that time. So I, you could see where that collision might come into play, right? Yeah, and I think it's cool that they eventually came back to him or he came back to them. Yeah. And, you know, they didn't hold any ill will at that point and they needed a, you know, a bassist and it worked out well. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Night Watchman. So why don't you talk about this? I know you love this side A. So okay. just, why don't you talk about the rest of side A and then I will give you my take on it. Sounds good. Okay, the first thing that I really, really like about Night Watchmen, it's a geeky thing again. Like I talk about song structure, right? So usually songs are, especially rock and roll songs are verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, maybe a solo, and then chorus out, right? But this one's one of those ones where it flips it because the chorus comes in first. I'm a night watchman, I need security, all that kind of stuff. That's your course. This one's B A B A C B. So I just I like that for starters. I think that's just a really neat little thing to do. Um, and then you've got one of the best drum tracks that Stan Lynch ever put on a Heartbreakers record. To me, it's really really subtle. It's very very clever. It's got that sync, that nice groove syncopation to it. And then you get that wonderful, you know, Paul Zola called it spidery guitar lick from Mike. And then again, it's that first sort of step into really developing a character. And it's, you know, obviously it comes from a real life conversation or conversations that Tom was having with his night watchman. So all those things combined, I think it just gives it a completely unique feel. And it doesn't sound like anything else they've done up to this point. I mean, not even close, right? It's so far away from everything else they've put out. So for that, for those reasons, I absolutely adore this song. Yeah, I like the guitar riff, the spidery guitar riff. So, you know, revisiting this album, um, and especially, I guess maybe I got my expectations a little bit too high when you were saying it's your favorite <laughs> side A. Yeah, I think, I, like I don't remember exactly what you said. It was something about your favorite side A of his catalog. Um, I would say Dan the Torpedoes, uh, but and that doesn't even take into account Full Moon Fever, Wildflowers, etc. But yeah. uh, of the Heartbreakers records, uh, I would say this is 
you know, this, these next three songs sort of surprised me a little bit. I wouldn't go crazy on them in terms of the ratings, but I think like well, night watchman, the guitar is really cool. Um, yeah. I think, and then you mentioned the story aspect of it and then finding out that this was a guy that was, you know, stationed at his house to just be security. Yeah. And he's out there talking to him. Imagine that. Like you're just, yeah. you know, you're, you're talking with Tom Petty and he's the only one up at the house and you have a chat <laughs> with him on a nightly basis. That'd be pretty cool. I think my, um, I did, I did do some overnight security for the Chicago bears, uh, training camp when I was in college Oh no! At, mid, at midnight. Yeah. I'm a Packer fan too. So they held it at UW <laughs> Platteville, uh, in Wisconsin, but, um, I, that midnight to 6.00 AM, uh, shift is rough. Cause you're just by yourself. You have the occasional, uh, groupie trying to, to break into the dorm where the yeah. players are, are staying and you have to deal with that, but it's pretty lonely out there. So maybe it just kind of brought back some bad memories, lonely memories of mine. That's why <laughs> I didn't like it as much as you did. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, that, anybody who's never worked a night shift, it is a really odd thing because your body's all out of whack. It, it, like you said, it's so quiet. I was my time in the military. I served a bit of time in Northern Ireland, and when you're in Central duty over there, same thing. You just you sort of sitting in this tower, watching nothing happen for hours and hours and hours and hours, right? But then when something does happen, it's like, oh, so it's 99% pure boredom, 1% sheer terror, right? So I think that's more sort of night watchmen or security kind of jobs is essentially the same thing, right? Yeah, I mean, this is also bringing back a memory because I would usually sit there uh, on the bench outside the dorm and I would be reading my fantasy football magazines. And this is my first, like, uh, I would have three or four of them and I would read them all through the, through, through the night. So that was like my first research for my, what ended up being my career. So I guess that's pretty funny too. <laughs> so just talking about um you know story building and characters and that kind of thing something big then we're heading into that this is the first time where tom really gets into storytelling mode you know we get we end up with spike we end up with lots of other stories but this was the first one really i think um oh, i can't remember which song it is off the first album now i'm just gonna annoy me there's another one where it's kind of getting it wild one forever where it gets into a little bit but this is the one really where it's a narrative um, so that's what I love about this song. And then I wanted to ask you about Speedball. So I'd always sort of read this as Speedball is the character who's working on something big. But I was having a conversation with someone online about it, and they see it. No, they think that the character who's working on something big isn't named, and Speedball is sort of a peripheral character who comes in and is almost kind of the one who screws everything up, which I found like an interesting angle. And I thought, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Huh. So I'm going to have to been going back to it and thinking about this song more. And I think it's, again, that... Tom had such an ability to write things clearly, but leave enough ambiguity in there so that you could really sort of take things any way you wanted to. So thoughts? On yeah, that? I'd have to. Yeah, I'd have to revisit that to sort mm -hmm. of listen for that again. I didn't. Uh, I didn't catch that. Um, I really liked the groove on it. Um, he did. Tom did say that it was one of his first attempts at really writing a story with characters. And as you mentioned, this is like two in a row here with a uh, with a character. Yeah. Uh, nice organ from Ben Mont. Uh, I like that quite a bit. And does a guy, the main character, die in the end? Is that the is that the finishing? This is a little. It's a little down, a little bit of a downer, maybe. It's it's that thing though, and, and again, that's left open to interpretation. You know, the maids are talking; they find him on the still made bed, but you know, it's not explicit that he's actually dead. But really, to me, that's the only inference you can draw from it. So again, I think you know, if you want to make, if anyone ever wants to make a Tom Petty themed Hollywood drama movie, this would be a great little. Great little plot line to hang your, uh, your story around and all the characters around, right? Yeah, for sure. I would give uh, both Night Watchmen and something big a 6 out of 10. So that's where I'm at. Six. Might be a little harsh. Oh. Might be a little harsh for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I... I'd I do both of them as 10s. I'd have to... Wow. I think I might have gone 10 on both. Just because I, I think sonically... And musically, the yeah, I did. <laughs> and, and again, I tend to overrate this album, I think, probably. But sonically, musically, and lyrically, and vocally, I, everything, everything. What I start from, and I think we've talked about this before, I start from a point of what am I going to criticize? Where do I take things away rather than saying, you know, rather than starting from a five and working up, I tend to start from 10 and work down, is what I try to do. Um, but I will accept that maybe they're not as good as the first two tracks. But to me, they're just, I wouldn't change a single note in either of them, you know? Hey, if you love it, you love it. Absolutely. Art is subjective. Music is subjective. We're okay. Yeah, and talking about talking about subjective and overrating thing, King's Road. So King's Road to me again, I mean, I talked ad nauseum, probably too much in the episode about this, about the it's sort of its place in my history growing up. And sort of when I got stationed in London as I was a pretty young man, and I come from a, a working class town, 
and suddenly you're thrown into the sort of the bright lights of one of the biggest cities on the planet, you know, and I'm also stationed in Chelsea, which is one of the richest areas of London. And the place where we're going to go drinking every weekend is the King's Road, where, you know, you've got film stars and athletes and models and all these kinds of people milling around. So it's this weird displacement of some scruffy kid from a coal mine in town walking past, you know, David Bowie and Iman and all these different people. So I've got that real strong connection to the King's Road. And again, the the lyric is, it's fun, it's a jaunty, bouncy, upbeat, you know, as I, I hope we would call it, a banger. Um, and so all those sort of elements combined just make it a, a like a really, really sentimental favorite for me. Yeah, I mentioned, I one of my notes is upbeat, kind of a banger. Uh, and <laughs> that, I had to go look up King's Road and what it was. Like, I didn't, you know, I'm yeah. not from there. I didn't know what it was and then figured it out. I, I thought it was interesting knowing that he wrote King's Highway uh, later on in his career that he had a King's Road earlier in his career. And I was trying to figure, you know, was that related at all? It wasn't, but um, it sounds like a really interesting street or area. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. it, all through the sort of fifties and sixties, it's like with Carnaby street and the, and uh, maybe sort of, um, oh goodness gracious, Camden, Camden market. It's one of the sort of the cultural hotspots in, in London. And so there's a, a very famous soccer player named George Best who, as good as, or I would argue maybe even better than Pele, but he was Northern Irish, so he never played at the World Cup, so didn't really get the same kind of level of exposure. But he was also a bit of a partier and a fashion guru, so he had a boutique on the King's Road that he'd opened with some friends of his. And so you get up, this is where that kind of this thing started where culturally a lot of famous people started gravitating towards this place. It was also back in the day where all the, the major fashion stores were. Um, and again, just like a, and I think there was even like a, a Bentley um, outlet store there. There was there was all sorts of places there where money sort of drifted and gathered around the King's Road. So just culturally, it's a really important part of uh, of London's history and certainly Chelsea's history. Yeah, and I would say that with with Petty too, they sort of broke in the UK before they broke here. Uh, and it's cool that he's sort of giving them a nod uh, with a track on his fourth, fourth album uh, that's basically London-centric. So pretty cool. Absolutely. Pretty cool track. I, I gave it a six out of 10. Again, I think it's solid. I wouldn't... Uh, you know, skip it, uh, but I'm not seeking it out either. Okay. No playlists? Not on one of your playlists? I don't know if it made any of my playlists. I did add <laughs> one, but I'll talk a little bit later, that I okay. that I sort of discovered during this uh, re-lesson of Hard Promises. Yeah, it's, I think it's it's always in the, I think it's probably one of the top five in most of my playlists, because if I'm listening to Tom Petty, I want to listen to King's Rose. So I think the other song we were going to talk about, and then we have to talk about, is definitely his Insider. Yes. Um. Again, the lyrics for Corner to Tom were written pretty quickly. Um, and it was one of those that, you know, he'd, he'd written, or Stevie Nicks had asked him to write a song. This was the song that he wrote, but then sort of realized that, ah, I don't really think I can give this one to Stevie. I have to I have to keep this one. But of course, brings her back in because it is a, it is a duet. And it's funny because it's not a schmaltzy, you know, you take one verse, I take another verse. It's not that kind of crappy ballad that you sometimes get in, in rock music. It's just a beautifully sort of complimentary um, dual vocal and it's funny how some people just naturally fit together right like even you get great singers come together sometimes it just doesn't quite work either there's not chemistry or there's something tonally about the voices that don't blend but these two I mean they're just absolutely made for each other vocally yeah and I guess what happened was when they were when he was trying to teach her how to sing it she was always sort of just singing along and not taking sort of the lead vocal on it i mean there's not really a lead. he's he's singing you can hear him more than you can hear her but she's always there present yeah and then he just started to like it the way it was being sung and basically pulled it back and said we can't i can't give this to you and she was totally cool with it um this this is a, a great example of i would call them a mid a mid-tempo song he calls it a ballad he says that uh you know they didn't really release ballads as singles until free falling uh, yeah. which is quite a bit later. Um, and this is, you know, just sort of an underrated track because it just didn't get much radio airplay. Even Tom Petty fans that I know don't know this song very well. They're, you know, they're not digging into hard promises and, and listening to the side side two over and over again. Oh, um, so they, they may not know this one and uh, you get to, he plays it in concert once in a while. And it's sort of a mixed reaction in terms of who knows it and who doesn't know who, you know, doesn't recognize the track. So, what I'm getting at is this is a maybe the first or I don't know, second of, you know, surrender, but that surrender didn't make 
an album at this point. Um, but when, you know, these, these kind of slower tracks that weren't released to singles and just woefully underrated, like in, in, just incredible how, so how good this song is. And they sang so well together and it was sort of a, you know, a, a sign of things to come. Uh, just, I love this track. I mean, I give it a nine or a 10 out of 10, uh, definitely on all my playlists with him and yeah. uh, his playlists and just, just an incredible track. Well, as you said, like it wasn't released as a single. And I generally, I think that's one of the few, I know as we get into producer for a day, it's one of the few times where I think that that's just the wrong decision. Because to me, if you release that song, I, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a surefire number one, or it's a, certainly it would be getting tons and tons of airplay. Because again, you've got Stevie Nicks, who, as we talked about, was kind of at the height of her powers. Fleetwood Mac was huge, late 70s, early 80s, right? I mean, you've got this sort of, this do any of you want to, and you want to sort of push that angle where you can leverage her popularity as well as Tom's, you know, the success of Damn the Torpedoes. If you release that as either the second or third track from the album, I think it lands really hard. Yeah, maybe you release it after Stop Dragging My Heart Around, Knock Her Off yeah. the, the chart. It's payback. <laughs> Bring it uh, back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think later on in his career, they released quite a few ballads. I mean, there's a we'll talk about a bunch of them as a, as we go on. And at some point, there was a shift like, oh, yeah, these are really good songs, too, that can be hits, and we should definitely release them. Absolutely. Okay, so you said there was one other song that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, I think, the, I think the I'm closing track. <laughs> yeah, the, the closing track, You Can Still Change Your Mind. And this is uh, one that sort of came out uh as i listened to it over a few times and i the space there again we have this weird spacey intro i don't know if you have a, yeah. if you have a thought about that but it was it kind of threw me off at the start but then it just kind of goes into a typical uh petty ballad slow like pensive yeah. uh, song and i love closing albums with with that sort of vibe i think it's the fourth best song on the album after uh the waiting a woman in love and insider um so I added it to my Dogs with Wings uh, box set playlist, and it's definitely one I want to seek out a little bit more. But I, I, that, that intro is, throws me. I, it's almost like we, they just wanted to put something out that says, yes, we know how to use a synthesizer. <laughs> um, we're, we're choosing not to, but here's a little taste if you really want to hear some, some synth. I don't know. Uh, but the, the track's really good. And I like, I like the, uh, the, the vocals. You really kind of have to listen to them. But uh, Stevie Nicks sings back up on, on this one as well. And I, yeah. you know, they, they sound so great together. Yeah, and it's a it's a Mike Campbell composition, right? Like the musically, it was, and, and again, one that you think not necessarily the one you would pick out as a Mike Campbell tune because he's more he tends to leans into the rock side of things more. Or certainly, those are the ones that Tom connects with. But this one, no, I totally agree. Now, the intro with this one, it, I agree. Like again, you just think, well, I don't, why are we padding out space with this? But at least it's not as long as Louisiana Rain. Yes, you know what I mean. At least it doesn't go on for quite as long as it's not a sort of it's not a minute. So yes. I can live with this one. Um, it doesn't upset me quite as much as the other ones, but um, but yeah, it's, it's an odd choice, definitely. And I, and especially with Benmont, because I think about that because Benmont's an organ player and was quite a purist about you know he didn't like using too many sort of gadgets and gizmos. Like he it, he can make the album sound the way it sounds, and he can make the organ sound the way it sounds. He controls the Leslie when he's playing with his Leslie. He controls all those kinds. Of, they're not doing that in post, right? So to have those sort of synthy bits in there, which again, I mean other than Don't Come Around Here No More and some stuff off Long After Dark, there's not a ton of synth in Tom Petty's music. You know, so I wonder, right. it just seems so incongruous to have them on two really rock and roll albums. They are, these, you know, Hard Promises Down the Top, he does the rock and roll albums, so they just don't quite, they don't quite fit. And I don't know, I don't know why they're there. <laughs> yeah, I would love, and this is a great example of just being a fly on the wall when they're making these decisions and, and yeah. like how much thought went into that like as you mentioned just not a lot of synth on any of his records they were very much a a band that wanted to sound timeless and they didn't jump in with the fads uh very yeah. often so uh it, it was a curious choice but the, the track itself stands up and i think it overcomes it um it is definitely something that throws you off though when it comes on a playlist because you're like what you know what's this oh yeah this is <laughs> the opening to, you can still change your mind <laughs> But yeah, and a great closer, as you said. I mean, again, I I, I like that too. I like a I want e either one of two things. I either want something that's going to really sort of mellow me out and just drop me back into place. Okay, that is excellent. Or just thrash your balls off, right? Something that's either one end of the extreme or the other. And I love that this one sort of does has that drop off where you just think, okay, well, again, it's softer. It's not quite got that bite on the guitars. They've kind of backed a lot of that stuff off. The vocal attack isn't there. It's much more even in sort of that uh, delivery. So yeah, perfect closer for me. 
Okay, we should talk about our top three, and I know we're going to differ on this. Um, and I've done I've done this in like I've I've done this a certain way. I've gone with my favorite three rather than what I think the top three songs are. So my favorite three are the three albums that are three songs that are going on, on my EP are the waiting. It just that has to be there. Something big because again I just absolutely love that song to death and insider because it's just again so 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 strong. Now if I was going with, if I was going with the strongest three then I would drop out something big and I would put in a woman in love. I would definitely okay. say those would be my three if I was doing it that way. So yeah, I would that that's what, where I landed. So I went the waiting. I would say insider second, and then a woman in love third. And uh, it to me this these three are head and shoulders above the rest of the album in my in my opinion. Uh, yeah. So not not a hard decision for me. I think the the big decision is you know what's number two after the waiting. But I think insider stands above uh, a woman in love. Okay, I'm playing producer for a day. I. Was when going through this, uh, this was, you know, because I think on the first three albums, I've subbed out one song and put something else in. And I think as much as anything, just out of mischief, right? You want to be, you want to create a talking point on your podcast. And, um, but for this one, there certainly isn't anything I could really drop. You know, I, when I went through the track list and the only song, like if I was going to bring in the studio version or the original version of Stop Dragging My Heart Around without Stevie Nicks' vocals, and we didn't talk about that song. Um, you know, obviously that was a song that they'd recorded and was intended for this album, but when Insider, when Tom decided to keep Insider, he then gave Stop Dragging My Heart Around to Stevie and she just overdubbed vocals on top of the, you know, on top of the track that was already finished and sort of in the can. So, but I really like that version without her vocal. I love it with her vocal, but I like the version without her vocal too. So the only thing I might do is add that in. And if you would have sort of put a gun to my head and tell me that I have to take one track off to put one in, then the only one I could stand to lose on this album is The Criminal Kind. And it's not because I think it's a weak track or I don't like it, but I like it least out of the 10. So when I went through it, my sequencing was, I mean, the side one as is. I didn't change a damn thing. Um, side two, I opened with Insider because I would have preferred to see them start off with the strongest side song there and then go Thing About You, Letting You Go, the criminal kind stop dragging my heart around and you can still change your mind to close. So I know I've broken the sort of the vinyl time limits there, but if we're, if we're going to do it this philosophically and sort of, you know, okay, well we can do anything we like. I would go with 11 on the album and that's the way I think I would do it. Yeah. And I would uh, just say that when we look at the hard promises and you're higher on the album than I am, yep. but um, when we look at it from this viewpoint way in the future, uh, knowing that stop, stop dragging my <clears throat> heart around uh, came out of these sessions, I think we have to sort of look at it, the the album a little bit differently because if this if that had been included on the album, it would have been a, a giant hit, and you could maybe argue that the top three or four songs are up there with "Damn the Torpedoes." Uh, you could make that case. Yeah. Um, so I I probably you know me I like to get the the the, the good stuff up front. Yeah. And if you just, I would like you to do this exercise is maybe just put the waiting a woman in love and then insider those three in a row and listen to them. I think insider really follows up a woman in love really well. Okay. And uh, so just listen to those three and see if that would change your mind at all on, on side A. I know you love side A, but that was my <laughs> one pitch. Uh, and then, you know, I don't know that they can take ownership over to stop dragging my heart around. I do like that. It did make some of the, um, greatest his compilations and stuff later on yeah um but uh you know putting that on the album I, I think that would be a good one to start side two with or maybe you, you put it somewhere inside a i didn't put a lot of thought into the producer of a day because i think this is sequenced pretty well yeah the only thing i thought of was maybe insider third after the waiting and a woman in love and so as a sort of you know we, we always talk about once we've gone through these things um and I, I knew that Insider was going to be on side one for your uh, for your producer. I, I, I just knew that was happening. Um, I think as an album, though, we talked about it with Damn the Torpedoes. Torpedoes was the first album where it sounded like a really cohesive album rather than a set of 10 songs. And I think that Hard Promises took everything that it did well on Damn the Torpedoes and really locked it in. Like this is, production-wise, this album sounds phenomenal. Like Jimmy I is probably one of Jimmy Iovine's top four or five albums sonically that he ever produced. You know, Time Torpedoes would be in there as well. Um, and so sort of I like that when I put it on and listen to the album as a whole, and I tend to listen to this album a lot as an album, probably more than anything other than Wildflowers, I would say, maybe, or maybe Last DJ. So those are sort of the three that I listen to as an album most frequently. It just all fits to me. 
again, like you said, the sequencing is great. Like the, the bounce of everything, the way that the songs change pace, everything sort of, it's just settled to me. It just works so, so well. And that's why I love this album so much is because of the the overall feel of it. Yeah, I think part of part of my not wanting to change a whole lot um, is is that we're now, we're past the point where he broke out and had the huge album and you don't necessarily have to have all your best songs on side A and, and yeah. try to really grab, grab you know, the, the, the fan or the uh, the DJ and try to get him to play your music because they're going to play it uh, regardless. So I think he's earned that, earned that right to um, uh, sort of sequence it the way he wants to. I agree. And so, yeah, you, you sort of sent me a pitch to say that, you know, we, we should be putting Insider on uh, as, as track three. And I'm going to, when I create the playlist, I will uh, definitely give that a good listen and see how it feels. It's going to be, it'd be really weird though, hey, because you know, when you, when you listen to an album with five, 10 seconds of the song to go, your brain's already saying, well, I know what comes next. And before that first chord of the next song, it's already there in your mind, right? With albums that you love and albums that you know. Yeah. And this is especially one for you. You love Side A, yeah. side a so much that this would be, a, this is, this is going to, to, uh, test you as much as it possibly can <laughs> so but where would you put this one then in sort of the entire catalog we always try and do that not to say we're not ranking obviously but roughly where about where does it sit for you uh, you know i think it's important on a number of levels i think it's a solid follow-up to damn the torpedoes especially if you think about the fact that stop dragging my heart around came out of the sessions i think that really you know i think if, i think if you're just a kind of a casual fan you might say oh this wasn't as good as damn the torpedoes but knowing that a number one hit came out of it for, for Stevie yeah. um, might change your mind a little bit on that. Um, I think it did what it needed to do in terms of, it, it wasn't just like a thrown together. Uh, you, you're going to get it type album. Like they just, they, they, they took their time with it and it sounded, it's, it sounds good. It sounds great. As you mentioned. And um, I think it's sort of, it, the things start to decline a little bit, but there's this like this series of albums here that we're going to talk about them. Um, yeah. they, they all, they all have at least one big hit on them. They have another like minor hit or kind of medium hit and they all have a really good, uh, you know, album track. That's really at least one that's just totally overlooked. And it's sort of a, uh, situation that he got into for the next few albums before full moon fever. And I think he was, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too, but he was a little bit, a little bit of a crossroads there. Yeah. Um, he was still knocking out good albums and hits but uh maybe not as big as damn the torpedoes so i think we're we're sort of um it's a really it's really a good follow-up to damn the torpedoes especially when you take into account that step stop dragging your your heart i don't want to keep repeating myself but that yeah th that that track would have been the biggest hit on this album if it had been included so i think we just have to sort of underline that when looking at it within his catalog yeah absolutely and we didn't talk about the the b-sides woman in love gator on the lawn which again, to me, I was, I was going to mention to you, I was listening to it again this morning, and it's got sort of, it's obviously that sort of, you know, Carl Perkins, Shed Atkins, real sort of old 50s sort of rock and roll, rootsy kind of stuff that Tom would have been listening to, like Elvis and that kind of stuff. So it sits in that part of his musical background. But when I listen to the to the sort of the, the rhythm of it and the way the guitar is picked, it's got a lot of similarities to some of the stuff they would go on to do with the Wilburys. So again, those influences sort of come through and you can see it's nice to see that those influences were already there for Tom and maybe he brought some of that stuff to the Wilburys rather than, because you'd assume that that was Orbison or or Harrison bringing that sort of stuff in. But no, Tom Petty had a lot of love for that kind of music. So I love that song. It's just a fun, like you said, it's just them probably just messing around. Maybe that's just even a one one take Jake vocal where he just was horsing around in the studio and then I know what, let's keep that. That's a good B-side. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad they kept it around and it ended up in the playback box set as well. Yeah. Uh, and I, I do think it was them goofing around. I think the other thing I wanted to mention was that he didn't like the cover art to this album. He mentioned it was kind of boring. It was, you know, in a record store. But I think when you you look back, and this is the album where the, the record company wanted to raise the price to $9.98. And yep. they wanted to make more money off of Tom Petty, uh, his popularity. And he fought them and to keep them at, keep it at $8.98. Uh, and didn't want his fans to think that he was the one that was okay with this price increase. They're yeah. going to, you know, not like him for that. And so the the fact that he's got a photo in a record store, I thought was a little bit, it would be even funnier if it's, you know, there were records on there that said 998 or 898 yeah. or something. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I think that sort of it actually really works given the, the, what was going on at the time. Cause there was a lot of stress in his life regarding that. And he still knocked out this album and was yeah. fighting his uh, record company yet again. Uh, uh, on, on the pricing. So very interesting background to this album. 
Well, it's funny too on the pricing thing, which you know we had, we didn't. I'm glad we brought that up because if we if we'd omitted that, we would have been uh, we'd have had to come back on and and, and and splice that in somewhere. So, but it's that thing about I like too that he'd said that you know to me it was obvious that we had to fight this because you know you're just screwing the fans over for no good reason. And he said I thought that all my sort of colleagues would follow me, and no one did. So you know a lot of the other fans when they did resume to nine ninety eight, I was like oh yeah whatever. But Petty was sort of the lone the lone voice in no we do this for the fans right. So and I think that that. I think it's part of his legacy and part of his legend, right? I think that really sort of cemented him as the man of the people. This is the guy who's on our side. Yes, and I think that endeared him to the fans uh, even more. And like, as you mentioned, it's, I was going to mention the same thing, legacy. It's just part of his, it, you know, it didn't last long. Like The, the, the record company was like, okay, we, we're, we're going to back down on this. We'll just raise it for somebody else. And yeah, they did. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it wasn't Petty's album. He wasn't the one seen going up. And he is known now as fighting the record company, which is kind of cool. Yeah, and it's not it's not just a you know, it's not a sort of an ego thing and it's not a I don't know, like a it's not a grandstanding move. You know, because you do see that with acts sometimes where you think, well, this is PR now, because when you've got PR agents involved, they're doing this just to get that kudos. Well, this was genuinely Tom saying, No, this is not right. Like that's too much. And and, and it's only an extra dollar. And in today's terms, you think, well, an extra dollar, who who cares? Like a difference of eight ninety eight or nine ninety eight. But back in the day when you're when you don't have streaming services and you do have to buy all your music, you only get to buy. I remember growing up as a teenager, and you would have been the same buying cassettes or buying CDs or whatever. You only got so much budget, so that dollar could make a difference. You know, it, certainly in terms of being able to buy three or four instead of one or two, or you know. Yeah, I never like as a fan. I never felt like I was getting gouged by him, and it's just kind of this sort of like fighting for the fans thing. You know, he made a lot of money off of his fans and had a very great life because yeah. of it. But like every like every every dollar I spent on a show or any kind of merchandise or whatever, I felt like I was getting my money's worth because of you know where it was priced relative to everybody else. Yeah. He was always slower to raise his prices on his tickets than everybody else. I think he was reluctant to do that for this reason. Um, but I think you know, in certain situations, you know, third party people would get a hold of his tickets and then resell them. Um, so he was always trying to find ways with the, within the fan club to get his really good tickets really good seats for his shows he wanted those going to people that maybe couldn't afford to you know buy it from a third party um, yeah. so i think this sort of translated throughout his career as a sort of a one of those arcs of his legacy is that he was always fighting for the fans absolutely and we love him for it okay so we can probably wrap up there i think okay unless you have any final thoughts oh no we were going to do something that i totally forgot about there um so as listeners will know that I always, every week I give you a petty trivia question and we haven't been doing that in the uh, album, album rap. So what I thought we'd do is I sort of threw it over to John and said, well, you write a trivia question. You can throw it at me and then I'll try to answer it. And I'll probably edit out my answer if I get it right, just so that we can throw that out there and then we'll do it that way. Cause I think that would be a lot of fun. So John, you have a, a petty trivia question prepped for me. All right. I will say that I have not listened to every single one of your podcasts. So I, if I if I give you a trivia question that you've already asked, then we're going to have to edit this again. Okay. Uh, but uh, here's my trivia question for you. Uh, you come through uh, recorded for the Let Me Up. I've had enough sessions. Uh, features which famous rocker on the drums and bass, which he added in 1995, several years later than the original recording, for the release of the playback box set. Well, that's a great question. And as it happens, I do know the answer. Um, so I will edit it out and we, I'll put a bleep here maybe. That's what I'll do. I'll bleep it out and put the, the redacted over my mouth when it, on the episode. Um, it's, of course, uh, you know, he was the the man who came in. And there's a great, I, you've probably seen those. It must have been an award show or something with photos of Tom and just embracing big hugs, big smiles, clearly liked each other, bonded very quickly and very naturally. So good question. And I'm that'll throw, that'll throw a few people, if I guarantee it. Because playback, I don't think everyone has playback, right? Yeah, and you mentioned his name twice there, so make sure you bleep it I'll twice. Bleep it twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so um, we'll throw that up on the uh, on the socials, of course, and uh, we'll see what people come back with. Okay, thanks for tuning in, folks. Uh, make sure you go and follow John at 444 underscore John on Twitter. Um, and I want to say again, thanks so much for adding your uh, breadth of knowledge um, and your input to this podcast. It definitely enriches it, and we're getting good feedback from people who say they enjoy these episodes. 
Um, and again, in uh, an ideal world where neither of us had the actual jobs, we could probably just, you know, if we were high on the hog, we could uh, just do this live in person and this could be our jobs. This would be such a fun thing to do. Um, don't forget to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at The Tom Petty Project and on Twitter at Tom Petty Project. And you can find me on YouTube. Uh, go follow, like, subscribe as applicable and please leave a rating or a review if you haven't done that already. Um, until we meet again next week, and that will be an interview episode which i will announce later because i'm recording those later today um keep listening to and sharing tom's music try to be kind try to say i love you to someone at least once a day stay safe and healthy and i'll be back with you very soon to talk again with john about the next album which will be long after dark bye-bye